Are we on? Can you see the screen? The screen is on. Okay, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. It's amazing, Alhamdulillah, that we are doing Surah Kahaf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about our uh, extreme reliance on materialism, that Dajjal, and how we forget that everything is in the hands of God, right? And Alhamdulillah, little, little lessons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that, okay, so that's exactly what you're doing, so here you go. So no power of Zoom, no power of the internet, can do anything if the electricity disconnects. So Alhamdulillah, valuable lessons. So Alhamdulillah, we are reviewing uh, Surah Al-Kahf, which is a beautifully amazing Surah of the Quran, the 18th Surah of the Quran, and uh, which deals with the realities of this dunya. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to wake us up from all the deception and the dajjal which is around us and realize the significance of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this dunya and created us and for what purpose, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these amazing, beautiful four stories in the surah. And alhamdulillah, last week we reviewed one of them. We completed the story of the people of the cave. And inshallah, now we are going to move on from there. Inna alhamdulillah, ya rabbi laka alhamdu hatta tarda. ولك الحمد إذا ما رديت ولك الحمد بعد رضا ولك الحمد على كل حال اللهم لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب العالمين يا غفور الرحيم يا رحم الرحمين يا ذا الجلال والإكرام فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم So the underlying message of these ayat of Surah Tahaf are attempts to unveil as well as repudiate the human weakness, our weakness of attaching immense importance, yeah, and force focusing totally on the outer facade, on the appearance of things. Just like you see this bubble over here, you know, when kids make these so bubbles, don't they look so attractive? And we are focused on, if you are out in the sunshine, then you see all of these colors reflecting and they look so, in, you know, we are enamored uh, by the beauty of it and, you know, and then what happens, right? When we don't look at the innate realities and hidden deeper truths, how long does this bubble last? It literally takes a few seconds sometimes. Minute is a long time. And then pop goes the visa, right? So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in these beautiful and precious ayat is the fact that we are on a journey. And our hope, a believer's hope is in the afterlife. If you attach all your hopes and dreams and invest yourself completely and totally in this dunya, this dunya will let you down, just like that bubble. Because this dunya is like that bubble. This world will betray you. That's the fact. It's going to happen. Because you see, it is not designed to be a place of dreams come true, happily ever after. Allah has created it inherently temporary, inherently weak. And a place where our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the one hand is testing us and on the, on the other hand facilitating us in every possible way to pass the test with a solid A star. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who take serious lessons and who understand what the facade is and what the reality is, inshallah. So as we saw, you know, in the, in the previous ayat, in the story of how these young men understood what the facade is, what the dajjal is, right? And they had the courage to reject it, 
right? And they had the insight to make the right choices. And they could only do that because of their strong faith, right? So after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in ayah number 27, <clears throat> So, O my beloved Prophet, وسلم, you keep on reciting, you keep on reading what has been revealed to you from your master, from your Rabb. No one is going to change his words and you will not find in anyone other than him refuge. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and through him he's saying to you and me that do not allow them for Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people of the Quraysh, for you and me, everybody who's refuting this deen of Allah and who is challenging the Quran and who is talking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's ahadith as if they just are fabrications, right? Do not allow them to dictate what you should or should not talk about. The Quran will dictate to you what you should talk about, right? Take your cue from the Quran. When they continuously ask you questions, do not worry, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide you with the answers, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not to be intimidated with their questions and to just deliver what has been sent down to him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of those who are asking the questions, right? And this is really, truly so applicable to you and me today because left, right, and center, in all possible ways, people are trying to change the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does changing the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean? Right? Not necessarily making changes in the Quran, although that, that also happens. Right? But the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, changing the meaning. No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't apply to us right now. I, we were talking about Dajjal last week, big time. Yeah? I am my own person. Right? I know what my gender is. Uh, you are nobody to tell me who I am. All that kind of stuff. Allah is saying no one will be able to change his words. No one will be able to change his words, no matter how hard you try. Multahada means refuge. Dal halam, a space that has room to move about. It is not too tight. Right? When you've been tied up, but the ropes are not too tight, you're able to free yourself easily. Hmm? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't worry. Don't worry about what others are saying. You stick to the Quran and you get your cue from the Quran and you get your explanations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for us from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you'll be good to go. Right? So basically it's a warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anybody who tries to make changes in the ayat of the Quran, tries to make changes in the blueprint of optimum living that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the Quran, right? You can't change that. Moral values, the truths in the Quran, the haq in the Quran has got nothing to do with what age we are living in, right? Um, Allah is saying, tajida min dunihi multahada. It's a very strong warning. And if you dare make any change, yeah, if you dare do that, where are you going to go and hide? Who's going to protect you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Very uh, straightforward and a very harsh statement that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. Right? And, and this, then, you know, so basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you and me, when in Rome, do as Muslims do. Right? There's no need to bow down to pressure. There's no need to get so intimidated by X, Y, or Z because whatever they're saying is actually fluff. It's just like that bubble that is going to burst very soon. It's just that they don't realize it. Yeah? So, Keep, keep firm on your ground, on your position. Keep reciting the uh, verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then this ayah, ayah number 28. You know what you and I need to do? We need to print this out. Yeah. We need to put it up somewhere in our room where we can see it every day. Right. Or highlight it in your Qurans. I hope that you guys have carry a musaf with you. Have a musaf with you when you sit for these sessions. Right. So before the next story begins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you and me, you want to be like those young men, the, 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 those who were steadfast upon their being, and they kind of were willing to sacrifice anything and everything, the glitz and glamour of this dunya to preserve their faith. Well, okay, this is your lasso. This is what you should do. 
This is the uh, formula that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and me. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not just give us warnings in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give us stories just for the heck of it, right? This is not a book of history or geography, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us deep lessons and gives us tools that how is it that you can protect yourself from the jet, right? So Allah is saying, وَاشْبِرْ نَفْسَكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَطَاتِ وَالْعَشِي يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَةً وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ تُرِيدُ زِينَةَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا تُطِيعُ مَنْ أَخْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُطًا right? You should keep yourself firmly attached right? with those people who call upon their Rabb morning and evening. And why do they do this? Because they are seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You keep your gaze fixated on those who seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep yourself attached with them, enamored with them, in love with such people. Right? And it's amazing. One scholar said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about our gaze, right? Twice in the Quran, right? Once in Surah Nur, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, lower your gaze. Lower your gaze. Right? Lower your gaze from the beauties and attractions of this dunya. And over here, Allah is saying, fix your gaze on those who call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala morning and evening. And this scholar, he said that if we follow these two principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in the Quran about our eyes, about our gaze, of what we look at, inshallah, inshallah, our battle is won. Lower your gaze from temptations and fix your gaze on those who call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala morning and evening. Yeah. Do not follow any and every such person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made their spiritual heart empty of our zikr. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, what will make your gaze avert? What will make you go off-roading? The beauties and attractions of this world. Is that what you want? Right? Turidu zinat al dunya, hayat dunya. And a person whose heart is empty of the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do they end up doing? They end up following their own whims and desires, right? And then they become a person who is always transgressing and always exceeding limits, right? Furuta, afrat, tafrit, right? They're always all over the place. So make yourself patient with those who call upon your master in the late morning until the early evening. All they want is his pleasure. Don't allow your eyes to cross the fence beyond them hmm? because that will keep you focused. Do you want the beauty of this worldly life? And don't follow and be influenced by the person who ha whose heart we have emptied from our remembrance. He only follows his empty desires and everything he does is in excess. I mean, seriously, this is our last one. Write it down. Surah Kahaf, ayah number 28, the ayah which Allah has gifted us as a mercy from him for protection from Dajjal. What do you do? There are, there are some do's and there are some don'ts. What do you do? Have patience and self-control. Yeah, Make friends with those and look at those and be in the company of those who want to remember, who want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who remember him at all times. So important. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us, has told us, al maru ala dini khalili. A person is on the deen of his friend. Right? See what your company is. Who are you hanging out with? Who do you look at? Right? Who do you follow on social media? Hmm? Who are your influencers? If the influencers are those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night, fix your gaze on them. Follow them. Right? Like their posts, whatever. I don't know. Follow them. Just be with them. That is a lasso to keep you in control of your desires when you look at all the glitz and the glamour. Focus on not this dunya, but to those who want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Good company is going to be either our salvation or is going to be our destruction. That is a fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us. Yeah? We're always worried about who our children are meeting. We should worry about who we are meeting also. 
because that is going to influence our children as well inshallah and what don't what what should we not do don't get so easily impressed by glamour don't get impressed it's very easy to get impressed actually right somebody who's got like i don't know 50 million followers on instagram you're like oh wow that's quite something but see what they are sharing see what what influence they are sharing right you're not going to find by the way people who remember allah day and night you're not going to find them having 50 million or i don't know obscene amount of followers uh, on instagram or whatever or youtube or whatever their followers are limited actually if you look at it i remember researching for a for a class uh, uh, i think last year or something and i was looking at the instagram follow following of people hmm? so cristiano ronaldo who's the footballer he has the, the the maximum amount of followers right now and that's also very fickle nah? the numbers keep on changing and the whole list was full of uh, I, a couple of uh, athletes and the rest of them all of them were celebrities singers and actors and all of that i think ariana grande was on or on top as well and i forget all the names unfortunately but uh, yeah lot of followers lots of followers in the millions and then i looked at the followers of scholars right that we have contemporary scholars oh my god it's like uh, i don't know i don't know if i found any with a million i don't know perhaps i don't remember 100% but it was there was no contest there there really wasn't so you see it is very easy to get impressed by glamour by the shosha by the fluff it looks so attractive na sounds so attractive but allah subhanahu wa taala is saying don't get easily impressed by glamour don't make friends with those who don't remember allah subhanahu wa taala whose hearts are empty and who only only follow their desires and who are extreme in their behavior now when you see for example this extreme behavior back in the day when the quran was revealed who could ever have ever thought that people are going to be posting the most intimate stuff that human beings do with each other openly khulla on tiktok or whatever astaghfirullah right so don't get impressed by that because there is no limit to following your desires it the 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 bar gets lower and lower and lower with every passing day quite literally every passing day and now it's all in our faces this whole industry this whole industry of dajjal is in our faces because of social media and because of the advancement in communication and information right don't get easily uh, uh, impressed so please I- i'm not even joking you print this out put it up on your wall highlight it whatever but this i and and, and, and you see rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam has clearly told us to re- recite and read uh, surah kahf every friday that there's a reason for it there's a very very strong reason for it and this aya inshallah inshallah will be our savior may allah subhanahu wa taala give us the tawfiq to apply this in our lives and may allah subhanahu wa taala give us the tawfiq to find and be with those who remember allah subhanahu wa taala morning and evening ameen ya rabbal alamin then allah says in aya number 29 and oh my beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa qulil haqq mir rabbikum tell them the truth is from your master whoever wants he can believe and whoever wants can disbelieve fama sha afal yu'min wa ma sha afal yakfur right and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no doubt we have already prepared for the wrong doers a fire its walls have already surrounded them and if they ask for rain they will be rained upon immediately with the water which is going to be like yellow pus that will roast their faces allahumma ajini min an-nar allahumma ajini min an-nar what a horrible drink and what a horrible place to relax now the thing about this ayah is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first telling rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he should not be in desperation to want to convince those who disbelieve right and the same applies for us you make your best effort to do dawa but at the end of the day it is a personal choice isn't it you can make the best possible can you imagine anybody making dawa better than rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam right and were there more believers in his time or more disbelievers more disbelievers that is a harsh reality right we follow his example sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the t to the best of our ability right 
But at the end of the day, you cannot convince anyone. You really can't. They either get convinced or they don't. Either their heart opens to Allah or it doesn't. That's the way it is. You are not responsible for making anybody believe or disbelieve. That's not your responsibility. That is not your prerogative. It wasn't the Prophet's prerogative. It was no Prophet's prerogative. Rasulullah and all the Prophets before him. The, the, the job is what? To deliver to the best of your ability with a heart that really truly wants that everybody should come to guidance, including myself. Right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying something amazing over here in this ayah. Because you see, if you were to offer an incentive to the disbelievers, right, to believe, one would assume that it would be something positive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, what over here? He promises them hellfire. He promises them punishment. That is the incentive. You want to save yourself? Well, here we go. And uh, this word over here, they, they've been kind of surah di kuha, right? Uh, it means like a, it's a Farsi word actually, and it means it is a tent. And, and usually sometimes a tent that doesn't have a roof, which is used in weddings and all. So they're like kind of completely enveloped by this tent. And this ghaif that Allah is talking about, it is it means rain, right? Not too heavy, not too light. Yeah. And kal muhli yashwil wuju. Kal muhli, muhl is what? Pus that dri that drips from a corpse, from a dead body, right? Some yellow kind of formation of melted copper. Any liquid that is either very disgusting or very scary. Please just imagine that if even rain falls, right, and you want to save yourself, you put your head down, don't you? Uh -huh, so that it doesn't fall on your face. But these guys are in hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from that. When you're in hellfire, your necks are going to be held back and every drop will roast faces. Allahumma ajirni min al-nar. Allahumma ajirni min al-nar. Allahumma ajirni min al-nar. This water will not just hit their faces, but will, it will also travel down their throats. This is the incentive that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving to the disbelievers. And there's never a time in the Quran, right? I should not say never because, yeah, yes, probably never, that Allah talks about punishment and he doesn't talk about reward or vice versa. So in Ayah 30, Allah says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ إِنَّا لَا نُضِيُوا عَجْرًا مَنْ أَحْسَنَ عَمَلًا اللَّهُمَّ رَبَّنَا جَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ Oh Allah, make us from among these people who are these people of Iman and Amle Salih. On the other hand, those who have believed and have done the good deeds asked of them, no doubt Allah is promising them, we will not waste the reward of those who do good deeds, right? Who have excelled in their amal, who have done what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked, who have kept themselves away from the glitter and glamour and useless pursuits of this dunya and focused on the akhirah. Allah will not let them go just like that without rewarding them. And our ihsan and Allah's ihsan, is there even any comparison, right? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Rahman, right? Hal jaza ul ahsanu illa al ahsan. So the jaza, the recompense of ahsan, will it be anything other than ahsan? And there is no comparison between what you and I can do to the best of our ability and to the ahsan of our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give his mercy to us and make us from among these people. What's going to happen? These are the people that are going to have the higher levels of paradise. From underneath them are live rivers. They will be adorned with bracelets made of gold and they will be dressed in clothes that are green in color and made of light silk and heavy silk, reclining back on large cushions. What an awesome reward. And how beautiful it is as a place to relax. Right? All their life, they have tried to, you know, literally save themselves, literally put themselves in a cave, quite literally. Yeah. And perhaps they do with little, 
when when there was need to to save their faith now they're going to get a reward beyond their wildest dreams in jannah and please note over here that previously there was water and i talked about water that was raining down on the disbelievers which was a form of punishment and torture and in paradise water runs beneath the believers and it is a source of joy right allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the same words the same stuff it can either be a source of joy or it can be a source of extreme pain and discomfort and you know this ayah implies that those people who are going to enter jannah are going to be treated like royalty right is going they were to be treated right like royalty so perhaps they were not invited to all the fancy and uh, royal uh, parties and functions going on in the dunya or they were invited and they chose not to go because they were they knew the dajjal behind it right it, and this is not to say that all parties and all functions are transgressing uh, the people who attend are all transgressing allah subhanahu wa taala so please uh, uh, realize that right but majority of worldly stuff that goes on the balls and the uh, you know we we've just been through the party season and the and the shabang weddings and all of that usually predominantly are those which are seeped in allah subhanahu wa taala's transgression right so they were perhaps either not invited or chose not to go to save their own skin quite literally so allah subhanahu wa taala is going to treat them like royalty in jannah inshallah 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 now from ayah number 32 to ayah number 44 allah subhanahu wa taala is going to talk about another story which is the story of a person who had two gardens right allah subhanahu wa taala says so very simple actually the stories in the quran as is so beautiful and so simplistic so very very uh, uh, simply once upon a time there were two guys simple as that wadrib lahum mathara rajulain ja'alna li ahadihima jannatayn min alam wa khafafnahuma bi nakhlin wa ja'alna bainahuma zar'a right now who were they where they dwelled or what their occupations were allah doesn't tell us he just starts by describing how he subhanahu wa ta'ala had given one of them a lot of wealth which was a lot more than the other one that was then then the other one was given point for them a example a similitude two men to one of whom we had assigned two gardens of grapes and we had surrounded both with date palms and had put between them fields of grain and then allah says in ayah number 33 let's just go over the ayat and then we'll see what lessons we can draw from from them so one of these guys he had two gardens right all kinds of fruit all kinds of yields happening right and which was undoubtedly probably very beautiful to behold as well so there was a lot of abundance that allah is talking about over here right each of the garden gave its fruit and with held nothing and we caused a river to gush forth from within right so he, he even had a source of fresh water and a source of fresh water for anybody who has a garden or a field or is into agriculture in any way is a precious precious commodity right because then he doesn't have to worry about how am i going to water my crops and that means that he's going to have more profit right so there was tremendous yield yield abundance of provision is emphasized by these words right that allah is using then in ayah number 34 allah subhanahu wa taala says <clears throat> and he had fruit and he said to his friend his uh, sahib his comrade when uh, he was speaking with him i am more than you in wealth and stronger in respect of nafara of man power right stronger in nafara okay so what we don't realize what allah is saying in the story is that what is the dajjal over here the dajjal is that abundance of provision in this dunya right when one's ambitions are realized when you have wealth and food and social contacts and relationships and money flows in without any problem freely yeah does that mean that allah loves you or does that mean that this is a test from allah subhanahu wa taala allah subhanahu wa taala test us by taking away our blessings but what we don't realize and what allah wants us to realize is that many a times allah subhanahu wa taala tests us by giving us a lot more right 
So yeah, so that's also something which we need to understand and see how it works. So long story short, a wealthy person begins to slowly think and believe that his wealth will last forever and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it, giving him so much in this dunya because he is pleased with him, right? If a consistently easy and hardship-free life makes him slip in his belief, right? And there are many people who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mainly in order that they be granted worldly blessings, right? That's all they ask for when they make their dua. This can slowly pave the way to eventually questioning whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists or not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this story is directly associating materialism yeah, with shirk, materialism with agnosticism, materialism with atheism. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing in this, in, in this story. So let's go on with the story. Then in ayah number uh, 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Ayah 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that um, yeah, and he went into his garden where while he wronged himself. He said, I think not that all this will ever perish. This is never going to this is always this is going to be abada forever and ever and ever, right? And then he said, What? He said, I don't think that the hour will ever come, right? The hour of judgment. And if indeed I am brought back to my Lord, like even if that happens and I go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'll surely find a better place, it'll be a better resort for me. Yeah. So it's not going to be such a big deal because he has made his own concept of the akhira and of, of judgment. Right? First of all, he says, the garden is not going to per perish. Although he's saying, my rab, rab, he's saying, rabbi, he admitted that he had a rab, right? But what he's saying is that whatever is mine is mine. Whatever is mine is mine. And we get into this trap when we are basing everything on this dunya everything in this dunya that we think I am solely responsible for getting, like I said, so many followers or that A star or that admission in that university or uh, that business which is flourishing or the, the homes, alhamdulillah, all over the world or whatever, right? So we can call this person uh, Mr. Have It All, right? So he's enjoying the fruits of his land but he is giving the credit to himself constantly. Yeah. Although he's saying, my Rabb. And in this ayah over here, when he's talking about Nafara in ayah number uh, uh, 34, Nafara could be like more in terms of numbers. It can be anything, right? It's your, it could be your kids, your extended family, friends, colleagues, uh, social contacts, followers, fans, servants, employees, and, you know, grandchildren, progeny, all of that nafara. And in today's digitized world, that is exactly what we focus on constantly all the time, all the time. Do we ever ask, who are my real friends? Do I really know this person in real life, right? Or what's, what's up, right? The genuine bonds, the genuine connections, which are based on sincerity, which are based on love, right? They can never be online. They just can't be online, no matter what anybody says. Yes, there are many benefits of being online, alhamdulillah, but those genuine connections are face-to-face, one-on-one holding each other's hand. We can never, ever let go of that. We really can't. Although alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, we do see that virtual communities also flourish, right? If they are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night, but we should never go for these numbers games, no matter which platform we are on. Right? This competition constantly, how well networked you are, that is something that needs to go. That is something that we need to understand the reality of it and the dajjal of it. Right? Uh, then in ayah number 39, oops, sorry, just let me get it to Hmm. No, let's get, go 
go to the verse before that. Now, ayah number 37, the companion who's not that well off. So Mr. Have it all, and this one is like the regular guy. So the regular guy is then saying, his friend, his companion, he answered him in the course of their discussion. Do you deny him who has created you out of dust and then out of a drop of sperm and in the end has fashioned you into a complete person, a complete man? Yeah. So this regular guy is a God-fearing person, right? And has solid belief in his heart. So he is logically counter-striking Mr. Have it all. Right. that the one who has created you, you are denying that person. Now, how is he denying uh, 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 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why is he using the word kafar, kufr, a kafar ta? Yani, kufr is what? To conceal, to deny, to not acknowledge the favors and benefits of, to reject or to be ungrateful. All of these meanings are the meanings of kufr, right? And the word which is opposite of that is shukr. So anyone who believes like the Mr. Have it all did, that their worldly possessions will never wane, that the hour will not be established, that they will never be returned to the creator, or even if they are returned to the creator, they're going to be in a much better place, no matter what they've done in this dunya. That is kufr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the kufr of the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is not realizing what the reality of their situation actually is. So this companion is trying to make, you know, talk some sense into him. Because he says, as for myself, right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my Lord, and I do not associate anyone with my Lord. You see, Allah is saying in these ayat very clearly, what kind of shirk is he talking about over here? Allah is talking about shirk. The man is not to doing shirk, is he, apparently. He's not uh, uh, buying down to another deity, right? He's not doing idol worship or anything like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that trusting in dunya alone is shirk. Your reliance is not on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you are relying on your garden and your investments and all of that. Right? Just like when you start your car in the morning and the engine is running, you attribute it to the, the great car that you have bought, right? That, oh my God, that's a good brand. Yeah. In reality, it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who allowed your car to start. Right? When you're taking medicine for whatever, for your headache or for an infection, etc., right? where do you get the shifa from? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the doctor, not the medicine. That is a means most certainly, but the shifa is from God. When you are say recovering from cancer or a serious disease, you attribute it to chemotherapy, but in reality, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who removed the cancer from you. So this Mr. Have it all, right? It wasn't him that he was so successful. It wasn't because of his hard work or his effort that he was so successful. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who made it possible. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who should be given credit for everything that this person had, yeah? And then he goes on to say the friend, and alas, if you had but said on entering your garden, Masha Allah, la quwata illa billah. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, there is no power except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although, as you see, I have less wealth and offspring than you. So this term, Masha Allah, when we use it, it means that we are attributing whatever it is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by the way, mashallah does not solely refer to good occasions. For example, we generally say, right, if somebody is getting married, mashallah, when, uh, when, you, when somebody has a baby, mashallah, or when somebody has passed an exam, whatever, something which is positive and good, we say mashallah. If someone is ill, we don't usually say that. But technically what scholars tell us is that mashallah means if Allah wills, sorry, whatever Allah wills, good or bad, that is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Whatever we ha have around us is a product of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. So that's a little something that we should understand over here. He didn't say that. He didn't attribute whatever he had to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Then in ayah 40, 
Yet it may well be that my sustainer will give me something better than your garden, just as he may let he may let loose a calamity out of heaven upon your garden, so that it becomes a heap of barren dust, right? It becomes like that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number, ayah number 41, or its water sinks deep in the ground so that you will never be able to find it again. If that happens, what are you going to do? What are you going to do then? And this was a very intelligent and articulate speech by the, the one who didn't have much, right? So he's asking the Mr. Havidol on entering his lush, fertile garden. He did not, he didn't think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when beholding this amazing ni'mah that Allah had given him. And had Allah not willed, the land would not have been fertile, no matter how much hard work he had put in it. Right? A lot of times we see that, whether it's us or our children, we really do put in a lot of effort into doing a project, something, whatever it is. Uh, maybe kids are studying very hard for exams, right? Or you are studying very hard for something, or you're working hard to, say, set up a business, uh, 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 a home business. You're putting in a lot of effort. But you see, a friend is also putting in the same amount of effort. Their project works really well and yours doesn't. Illa masha Allah. Right? It is that is mashaAllah, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. You do your work, right? It doesn't mean you just sit, you, you do your you do your effort, you do your work, you also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for success, but no success or failure in this dunya comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This is pure tawheed, this belief. I put in my effort, that is my part, but I leave the result on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever result I get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the best in this dunya for me. Right? So you have to take it a uh, notch higher as well. Right? So this guy who doesn't have much, he has this firm belief that just as Allah has given to Mr. Have it all, he can give it to him as well. Or he could give something better as well. Yeah. So this is something which is absolute tawheed. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 42, and thus it happened that the fruitful gardens were encompassed by ruin. And there he was wringing his hands over all that he had spent on that which now lay waste, which had now tumbled to pieces to its very foundations. And all he could say was, oh, would that I had not attributed divine powers to anyone but my sustainer. Right? Lam ush. So he is actually coming to his senses over here, right? So eventually what happened was, we see over here that the ending of the story can actually be considered to be a happy one because the man is repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He lost his wealth, he lost everything, he lost his prestige even, whatever, because you see a lot of prestige, a lot of rizza comes with, with wealth. He's lost, lost that. But that was something which was very positive for him. Right? He realized it while he was still alive. Right? What we consider to be good or bad is being redefined in a revolutionary way by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here. Right? First, it was in relation to social hierarchy, and now it is in relation to wealth. In the first story, it was a social hierarchy that Allah was talking about, right? That those young men, they were like elites and all, and they chose to give everything up for the sake of Allah, and that was a good choice. Over here, there is this wealthy man who then realizes when his wealth is all destroyed that, oh my God, what I was doing was actually shirk. Oh my God, I did not understand that all this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we realize this while we are still alive and we have time to do a safar and we have time to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Then Akhirai number 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there were no supporters for him besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who could come to help him, nor was he able to defend himself. And seriously, when any calamity falls, whether it is a business loss, whether it is failing in exams, whether it is that a powerful earthquake, who do we turn to except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who's going to be a helper except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We must understand that. Nothing else is, will be there for us. That is where the power of protection rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the true God. He is the best in rewarding and he is best in requiting. Although 
Mr. Havitol had boasted of his surplus numbers, none of them could help him even a little bit against the destructive force that ruined his gardens. All alone, he now sat weeping with regret over the investment he had made and lost, regretting having committed shirk because of this temporary deceptive produce and prosperity that had deluded him into thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise shall not come to pass. Such an amazingly, amazingly beautiful story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him a harsh lesson, but actually it was a very merciful lesson. And we should all be scared. The scary part is that so many of us die in a state of delusion, only to wake up to reality as soon as our souls leave, leave our bodies. Will we have a chance of repenting? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all our transgressions and all of the ever thinking that what I have is because of me. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wake us up like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala woke up this person, right? Again, such a beautiful, beautiful parable and do understand so many lessons from it. Like for example, wealth is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in itself, inherently, there's nothing wrong with being rich. There's nothing wrong with having stuff, right? Because at the end of the day, it opens doors and those doors can lead to good just like they can, they can lead to evil. Anything that Allah has created in this dunya is not inherently evil. If you have, say, for example, you're an influencer. Can you imagine if you can influence 50 million people sitting in your room towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, towards the deen of Islam, towards charity, towards love for mankind, towards dignity, towards justice. Isn't that an amazing platform to have? It's how you use the stuff that Allah has given you. You have wealth and you give in charity. You're like Abu Bakr, right? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Ramadan is just around the corner. And there are many calls for charity. There were many calls for charity when it came to the earthquake that has recently happened, right? Imagine that Allah has blessed you with wealth and you spend and spend and spend for his sake in the morning, in the evening, by announcing it quietly. Alhamdulillah, you're earning your Jannah. So wealth in itself is not problematic, right? The problematic situation is that when you get into the dajjal of thinking that this wealth is mine, that is problematic. That is problematic, right? And um, another thing is about bragging. Yeah, this guy was kind of bragging, right? He was kind of rubbing it in that, uh, oh, you know, I'm so much better than you or whatever. I have so many followers and you don't and me this and me that was all me, me, me. Don't gloat. If Allah has given you something, Alhamdulillah, say Alhamdulillah, be humble, right? My teacher always gives this example. If there is a lot of fruit on a tree and the fruit ripens and it's thing, the tree becomes a little, the, the branches bow down, the branches, branches bend. If Allah has given you a lot more, you should have more humility. And there's no way that you should be flaunting it. And also, by the way, all wealthy people are not at all arrogant and full of themselves or stuck up at all. Just because someone invites you to their home, say, for example, and when you arrive, it turns out to be like a palatial villa uh, furnished in a manner that makes your door drop. Yeah. And your eyes gaze unblinkingly. Don't assume that this is all black money. Don't assume that this is all rishwat or, or some, some dodgy situation. Yeah. And don't assume that they have invited you to rub their affluence in your face. Right. Don't assume that at all. Uh, it's actually wrong. And if we have these kind of negative feelings, when we look at somebody's wealth, then that is our issue, not theirs. Right? That, that, that seriously is our issue. Then we should look into our heart that how is it that we take dunya? Because if we look at somebody else's dunya and are jealous of that, that means that dunya is huge in our eyes and in our hearts, although we don't have it. Although we don't have it, right? So that is something to think about, right? So there are many endearingly humble and down to earth and sincere wealthy people, right? And it's actually very inspiring to watch them consist consistently help others and, uh, you know, and give in charity and to inspire others. It's amazing, right? So if ever you experience negative feelings at, at anybody's ni'ma, right? At, at anybody's risk, they don't deserve it. I do. Why do they have so much and I don't? 
and really seriously, we need to get rid of envy and self-esteem issues from our hearts. Thanks. So Alhamdulillah, what a beautiful, beautiful story. And there are so many other lessons that you can derive from it. And another thing about reading uh, Surah Kaha uh, once a week is that every time focus on certain ayat, every week focus, focus on certain ayat and internalize them, internalize them more and more. We should not just read Surah Kaha every Friday, just like, duh, 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 you know, as if uh, sometimes like we do Surah Fatiha in our salah, yeah, right? The whole idea is to contemplate. The whole idea is to find the dajjal around us. And the whole idea is find solutions how to get rid of that from our hearts. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 45, give them the example of worldly life. Worldly life is like water that comes down from the sky. Then the nutrients of the land begin to mix with them. Then the entire land and its crops become defeated. Winds can carry and throw them away and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always been in complete control of everything. Always, right? Explain the verse 44 also. Sorry. Uh, didn't we talk about verse number 44? Sorry. Hunalika al-walayatu lillahi al-haqq huwa khayrun thawabam wa khayrun ukhuba that there is a power of protection rests with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the true God. He's the best in rewarding and the best in requiting. I think we did talk about that, didn't we? Yeah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is literally describing our entire lives in ayah number 45 and 46. First of all, the life cycle of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, right? We are born, we are little, we become bigger, this life cycle continues. Then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us to a certain age when we are older, then what do we become? We are just like that, defeated, stubble, right? Uh, at the mercy of others. This is the life cycle of every creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in this dunya. And the only thing that prevails is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only thing that prevails is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in ayah number 46, so in ayah number 45, actually, Allah is saying, <clears throat> whatever worldly success we enjoy will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Because, you know, the primary focus of this surah is attacking tajal, materialism, etc. So we do know that this is a great fitna of our time. The great fitna of our time is that, right? And what the Jal is going to do, he's going to make the world seem better by bringing the dead to life and making barren lands bloom, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to scholars, is actually setting the stage for that person to come with all of this that he's discussing in this surah, right? About all kinds of Dajjal that we face. And then Allah says, Al Malu wal Banuna Zina tul Hayat Dunya, Wal Bakiya to Shali Hatu Khairun Amda Robbika Thawaba Muahirun Amala. Money and children, sons, are the beauty of this dunya, of this worldly life. Zenith. Zenith, Zenith, Zenith. You're going to see this is repeated in Surah Kaab over and over again. That glitter and that glamour and that uh, absolute lushness of having more, right? And Allah is saying, and the remaining things are the righteous deeds as far as your master is concerned in terms of compensation and in terms of having hope in the future. Right? If only we understand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarizes assets and children. So this word, al banun sons, children, it can also mean like manpower or army or a gang or followers or fans, whichever way you want to understand that. So banun literally does mean sons, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means all of this. Because you see, most of us have future hopes regarding our wealth and our children, right? We are going to have uh, back in the day in tribal societies, even today, I guess, the more sons you have, the more prestige you have, right? You, the more uh, you have invested in your future. 
the more wealth that you invest here and there, your future is secure. We're always worried about saving for the rainy day. We're always worried about saving for the old age, for our old age. Now, listen, yes, saving for your old age, Alhamdulillah, not a bad idea, but just being focused on that, right? That is something you don't know what's going to happen, whether you're going to get to that old age or not. So putting all your hopes in material stuff is stupidity, is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying over here. Hmm? The only thing that you can rely on and put your hopes in are your good deeds. Because that is something that will make you eligible for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is something that you're going to take in the hereafter which is our real future in the first place, right? Nothing else is going to go past this dunya from us. Nothing else is going to go past. That's, that's it. It's only the good deeds. Salihat, amle salih. And amle salih comes with iman. Iman and amle salih. Iman and amle salih. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who understand this reality and don't completely ruin our lives by being totally consumed by our kids and totally consumed by material stuff around us. And may we see the dajjal behind it. Right? We have absolutely no idea whether our children are really going to be a sadhkai jari or not. We don't know that. Only Allah knows. We can most certainly do. Absolutely invest yourself in your children. But over-investing by and the price we pay for that is that we forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's all about my kids swimming lessons and my kids ballet lessons and my kids this lesson and that lesson and have absolutely no time for anything else that is ridiculous that is something that we need to think about and rethink inshallah subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen allahumma rabbana ja'alna minhum الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين يا غفور الرحيم يا رحم الراحمين يا ذل جلالي والإكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته